do two services, but I get to hear the music twice. I know I've said that line before, but it's true every single time. We need a stranger for this. We need a stranger for this. Earlier this week, as I was uh, talking about this exciting story that I just shared, our assistant director of religious education, Kat Good, told me the story of when she herself was a stranger at a wedding. She had just joined the Peace Corps and had been in Uganda for no more than a week or two. When she was invited to a wedding, she drove with her hosts way out into the countryside for the wedding celebration. She tried to keep a respectful distance as the families and as the village celebrated, but she was pulled into the center of the celebration. In fact, she was seated in a place of honor at the head table right next to the bride and groom and members of the wedding party. In fact, she says, when it came time to cut the cake, that she was called forward to cut the cake with the bride and groom. Some of you may know this about me, and some of you may not, although you may have your suspicions, but I am actually a mild to moderate introvert. The vast majority, it so happens, the vast majority of Unitarian Universalist ministers are introverts. More than two-thirds, I've heard. And I've heard that just about the same proportion of members of Unitarian Universalist congregations are introverts. And let me tell you, as an introvert, the idea of being pulled in off the street and fawned over by strangers and made the center of things is not my idea of a good time. It makes me downright uncomfortable. I see some nodding around the room. But more to the point of what I'm talking about, in the culture in which I was raised, Western, European American, white, educated, upper middle class culture, Weddings and funerals and baptisms and confirmations and birthday parties and anniversaries do not seem to require or even consider the role of the stranger. These are all private functions by invitation only. RSVP, Respondent Civil Play. But in other cultures, especially cultures that practice the Abrahamic faiths, as well as other cultures around the world, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, there is a recurrence of and a particular reverence for the sacred stranger, the essential stranger, the needed and necessary stranger. We need a stranger for this. My friend Naz mentions the Magi. And that's a story that coming up in another week, as we turn to December, you're going to be hearing the story of the Magi come up in popular culture and, and in, our, uh, in our larger culture. The Magi, we often say that they're kings or wise men or seers. But what if, what if we were to flip the script and understand them as three strangers who show up at a bris? and are treated as kings. My friend mentions Simon the Cyrene. Simon in the Gospels is the man who steps out from the crowd and carries Jesus' cross for a time on the way to the crucifixion. Now does anyone, besides members of the worship committee, who I already gave this answer to, does anyone know where Cyrene is located? We had, we had one person take a guess of a region at the, at the first service, and he was correct. Joe, Joe Swain uh, guessed Northern Africa. He's correct. Cyrene is actually a city in uh, northern Libya, near the coast of the Mediterranean. Cyrene, an ancient city in Libya. So 
this man, Simon the Cyrene, who plays this central and venerated role in the passion story, is an African stranger a long, long way from home. Or take the gospel story of the wedding at Cana, where Jesus is cast in the role of stranger. Now, I am not saying that Jesus was a wedding crasher. I'm just saying that he was a plus one. The type of guest who would ordinarily find himself seated at a table in the far corner of the room. But by the end of the night, he's taken over the bartending and is leading the toasts. We need a stranger for this. What if we were to change the way we told this story? or other stories, by remembering that at Jesus' birth and Jesus' death and throughout Jesus' life in between, the stranger is required to bless the story over and over and over again. There's a passage in Scripture, one of the most definitive passages that speaks to us today in our time. Leviticus 19.33 and 34. When the stranger resides with you in your land, you shall not oppress the stranger. The stranger who resides with you shall be to you as the citizen among you. You shall love the stranger as yourself, for you were once strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. I'll read that again. When the stranger resides with you in your land, you shall not oppress the stranger. The stranger who resides with you shall be to you as the citizen among you. You shall love the stranger as yourself, for you were once strangers in the land of Egypt. Whenever I heard, whenever I hear this passage, I always hear it in a way where it's clear that I am the subject, the one who is called to act, the one who is called to take agency. I am the one whose land it is. I am the one called to love and welcome the other, the stranger. There is a kind of subject-object dynamic, an active-passive dynamic. The citizen acts. The stranger is acted upon. And I wonder what would happen. What would happen if we took a little creative liberty with the text? If we changed the grammar of the text? If we switched up and switched around the roles? What if we were to say something like this? The citizen is in need of the stranger. Or the citizen is made whole by the stranger. Or the citizen exists in a state of need and dependence, and it is the stranger, the blessed presence of the stranger which fulfills the part of that need. That would be pretty radical, wouldn't it? And yet, and yet is that not what happens at the story of the wedding? We need a stranger for this. For the past six months, our church has practiced an intense and challenging and very beautiful kind of welcoming. Back on June 1st of this year, we welcomed Jamie, 21 year old asylum seeker from El Salvador, who lived in our manse for nearly six months. A few days ago, Jamie traveled to Dallas, Texas, to explore staying with her extended family. And Jamie will be back with us in April to pursue the next legal steps of her asylum case. For our sanctuary volunteers, this experience over the last nearly six months was intense and challenging, often frustrating, sometimes exasperating, and full of uncertainty at every time. Experience was complex and complicated. 
complicated by trauma that Jane faced on the streets of El Salvador and in detention in San Diego, complicated by illiteracy, yes, complicated by language, certainly, complicated by culture, absolutely, complemented by age and gender identity, undeniably, complicated by everything. And I'm so proud of the hard, hard work our volunteers with the Sanctuary of Immigrant Support Ministry did to welcome and support Jamie. And as I think about their work, I have to wipe my brow because I could have been so incredibly lost trying to do 5% of what these volunteers did. I learned from watching them and from this experience, though, I would like to reflect and name that there are certain gifts that came the other way. There are certain gifts that the stranger brought us that would not have been accessible to us any other way. Gifts of experience, of understanding, of deepening, of courage, of humility, of blessing that can only come through engagement. We need a stranger for this. My vision of church is that our church is whole and holy. The more open it is, the wider our doors, the wider our welcome, the more we see ourselves as a public place rather than a membership club. Church as a public place. Our worship service, every single worship service here is open to the public. It is actually worship for the public. Not just for us, but for anyone who walks in on this particular day. Our community events, whether it's musicals or the greeting or the auction, they in their own way are public events. Anyone welcome. It is with this sense of openness, that we entertain angels unaware and open ourselves to the blessing that comes when doors are open. We enter into a season, a season of gathering, often among family, often among friends, often among church community. A season of feasting, a season of celebrating, a season of time apart from our usual time. As we enter into that time, let us be mindful of this great religious teaching, which tells us that the welcoming of the stranger is not only a central religious task for the stranger's benefit, but indeed, indeed, is needed for us to be who we are called to be. Amen. Blessed be. Thank you. And as our cello quartet makes their way uh, back up this morning, we're going to sing number 126. This was a hymn that Glenn thought would sound wonderful on the cellos, and it does. And it's a favorite hymn of mine. So I invite us to join in singing, Come Thou Fountain of Every Blessing. 